street emergency? Um, there's somebody in my house. Where are you, please? Um, there's a 14. Killing the J-I-L-L-A-N-D-A. J J I double L A N D A place. What number? Fourteen. Is it units or a house? House. What town? What suburb? The gap. The gap. What you just heard was a portion of a triple zero call twenty year old Simona Zafarovska made at seven AM on October twenty eighth, twenty sixteen. Simona was holed up in her room when intruders broke into her home at Jalinda Place in The Gap, a suburb of Brisbane, Australia. She was awakened by her dogs barking, footsteps on the wood floors, and whispering among people. When officers arrived at 7.18am, they found a completely ransacked home with only Simona and her mother, Radhika, there. Radhika had been beaten to death. As investigators began questioning Simona, they noticed that she was well put together, not the profile of someone who had just woken up. Thousands of dollars in cash in the home were not taken. Neighbors who were awake at the time testified that they didn't hear dogs barking during the early morning hours. Simona's story wasn't adding up, and when a piece of wood turned up in evidence hours after the emergency call, Investigators would come to learn a far more shocking tale than a simple home invasion. This is the story of Simona Zafarovska. In the beautiful city of Brisbane, the capital of the state of Queensland in the northeast of Australia, lies a luxurious suburb known as The Gap. With a population of nearly 18,000 people, The Gap sits in the northwest side of the city. It's about as idyllic as it gets for a suburb. Over 45 lush green parks, creeks, playgrounds, dog areas, schools, shopping areas, and sporting clubs. It's a very safe place. And here, in Unit 14 in a residential housing subdivision, lived the Zafarovskas. Simona Zafarovska was born in 1996 in Macedonia, but not much else is known about her because, as the court and even Simona herself would come to learn in 2019, she was adopted when her parents were visiting their native country on one of their regular trips. Her adoptive mom, 54-year-old Radhika, was a cleaner for the Brisbane Supreme and District Courts, and Simona herself did some work as a cleaner to make some money. Not much is known about her adoptive dad, who died in a fire in Macedonia on one of those regular visits in 2011. Six months after the fire, Simona and her mother went back to Macedonia where her mom remarried in 2012 to a man named Jack Neshovska. The three first moved into an apartment in Brisbane, and then moved into the large house on Jalinda Place in the Gap. Sometime after moving, the house at Jalinda Place, which was mortgaged, was transferred into Simona's name as Radhika and Jack were having some marriage trouble. Radhika was concerned about the property falling in the hands of her husband if they were to end the marriage. It turned out to be a shrewd move, as the two eventually got a divorce. The transfer of the property to Simona was sort of an indication of how much Radhika loved her daughter. She worked hard to provide for Simona. In fact, people who knew the family often talked about Radhika spoiling Simona with expensive gifts. On one occasion, Radhika showed a friend an expensive gold necklace she bought for Simona's 21st birthday. Radhika even bought Simona her car. Simona, without a doubt, relied on Radhika for money. Considering she was a cleaner, it could be assumed that she sacrificed a lot to make sure that Simona had the best in life. 
Simona was a full-time student studying to become a teacher at Queensland University of Technology, a university in Brisbane. Radica paid her tuition. The mother and daughter pair had a very strong relationship, according to witnesses. They had been seen in public holding hands and looking happy together. On one trip to a Macedonian community get-together in August 2016, they were spotted being loving to each other. Remember this date. Simona had repeatedly testified that her bond with her mom was strong and that they would never really argue. Despite closeness with the local community, Radica was still concerned about their safety, as, after all, they did live in an upscale neighborhood. The family had two dogs, one recently purchased to guard the house. Radica also owned a machete for her protection. Sadly, Neither would assist her against home invaders who broke into the Zafirovska household on the morning of October 28, 2016. According to Simona's account, she told her mother goodnight at about 10 p.m. and took one of the dogs to its bed outside the front door. She then went to her room, watched some TV, took a shower, and then eventually fell asleep at around 3.30 a.m. Simona, who was in her room hiding under her blanket when she made that triple zero call, testified that she was awakened shortly before 7 a.m. to the dogs barking, the creaking of the wood floors, and whispering among individuals. Has someone broken in, have they? I don't know. I didn't 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 know. from the wooden balcony on the wooden floor. Wooden floor. Uh, yeah, I'm getting close up there. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Are, you, are you like upstairs and away from the person or what? Okay. Do you know if they got in the front or back? I don't know. Okay, okay, I've got a cop police on the way. 14 Jalinda place, that's the cat. All right. Anything at all you can... Is there anyone else, like children in the house? My, my mum. My mum and my dog. It's not your mother, is it, moving around? No, no. And... Uh, and... Uh, and uh, uh, would normally your dog bark? Yes. 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 But I can't, I can hear, I can hear them barking. Okay, okay, okay. I'm just, I'm just, yeah, 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 I'm getting police up there. We're calling for police to attend. We're calling on the radio. Okay, you're hiding in your bedroom, are you? Yes. Okay, what's your name? Simona. Okay, are you upstairs? Yes. Are the sounds coming from downstairs? Upstairs. Yes. Moment is... I can, I can hear, I can hear the, the, the wooden floor, the wooden floor. Okay, okay, yeah. So, the footsteps on the wooden floor. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm getting the police up there. They're on the way already, lights and sirens. It's not someone you suspect like an old boyfriend or something, is it? No, I don't have a boyfriend. Or, or a, a domestic violence order from a domestic violence thing. Oh. I don't, I don't know. Okay, okay. Senior constables Luis Child and Will Paddy were first to arrive at the scene. They climbed over a high front fence and were able to enter through the front door. The first thing they saw was Simona standing in the doorway of her room holding her phone. When asked where the noises came from, she pointed at her mother's room. Inside her mother's room, they found Radica under a blanket. When they peeled the cover back, they saw a gruesome scene. Radica's face was bruised and swollen, Blood effectively covered her entire face and dried blood pooled behind her. She was nearly cold to the touch. 
a feeling for a pulse returned nothing. She had been sleeping when the attack happened. Radhika was so badly beaten that paramedics who arrived at the scene didn't even try to resuscitate her. She was declared dead in her bed. She was lying on her back wearing a pajama shirt, pajama pants, and underpants. There was blood splatter all along the floor, the dresser, and the walls, with the patterns indicating that the attacker was on the bed when the blows were delivered. An investigator would later say, quote, it was the most violent murder I've ever seen, unquote. There were several lacerations on her face consistent with blood force trauma, but the wounds were so horrific that police initially thought that she had been shot. One particular one was noted, four parallel lacerations between her eyebrows, each measuring between 9 and 20 millimeters in length and 2 millimeters in width. The coroner said this type of injury came from one type of weapon. Radhika suffered 26 head injuries, likely from over 20 blows to the face and head. She suffered fractures to her skull, eye sockets, nose, and cheeks. The attacker effectively broke her face and head. This was seemingly an act of rage. Police described Simona as distressed. She asked to see her mother, but was denied. The police immediately noticed that her hair was, quote, very, very neat, very dry, perfect, unquote. Her nails were, quote, very neatly manicured, unquote. However, she had no smell of soap or shampoo or any similar cleansing agent on her, suggesting perhaps she didn't try to wash herself. She had no blood splatter on her and nothing else that would have raised suspicions. An observation of Simona's room found no blood stains or splatters, nor was there blood observed in any other part of the house outside of Radhika's room. A pack of rubber gloves was found above Simona's bed, but it was, for some reason, not examined by the police at the time. Simona was taken to a neighbor's house by paramedics for treatment. One paramedic noted that she, quote, looked quite well presented. Her hair had been done. She didn't look like she'd just woken up, unquote. A crime scenes officer then asked Simona to put on a zoot suit, a plastic garb to keep evidence on Simona. They then took DNA swabs of her mouth, fingernail scrapings, and took a photo of her hands. There was no blood, bruising, or damage to her hands. The lack of evidence obviously did not help with the case. The house was ransacked. Drawers were pulled out of cabinets and documents had been thrown all over the floor. On the dining room table there were cases containing cash, keys, a bank check made out to cash, and handwritten notes. An envelope containing $2,300 was found in Radhika's wardrobe. A brown paper bag with $1,100 was in Simona's desk drawer. There were purses with cash totaling $770 found in Simona's car in the garage. A locksmith who worked on the house testified that none of the doors in the house had been the subject of forced entry, and there was no evidence that the front door lock had been picked. Neighbors who were awake around the time of the emergency call said they didn't hear any barking dogs, even though they would hear the dogs bark when they did. One neighbor said she woke up about midnight and again at 3.30 a.m. and heard nothing. One observed a white utility truck parked in front of Simona's house at around midnight, but the truck left around 2 a.m. That truck, the neighbor said, had been in that area about two or three times that week. Another neighbor said they saw a hooded man standing near the home but then went jogging. Hours after the attack, as the home was being searched for clues, investigators stumbled upon what would be a key piece of evidence, a baseball bat-sized, partially synthetic piece of wood behind a wardrobe inside Simona's room. The piece of mod wood, which is a mix of recycled plastic, recycled paper, and wood products, weighed about three pounds. It had Radhika's blood on it.
couple of months before the home invasion, Simona flew out alone to Macedonia on summer holiday. Normally, she would travel with her mother, but her mother was okay with it, as Radica had already visited in the spring. While there, visiting beaches and local shops, she met an unnamed man nearly 20 years her senior, and the two struck up a conversation. After several days, the two decided to take the next step and start dating. As with the honeymoon period with a lot of relationships, the two were infatuated with each other. Simona seemingly more so than the man. That's because Simona, having been traveling back and forth between Australia and Macedonia regularly, decided it was best that she stay in Macedonia for the time being. By then, she had only completed a single year of university. You see, despite Radica pushing Simona to focus on school, Simona wasn't doing well in her classes. There was evidence that she was behind on her work and simply did not want to continue her educational pursuits at the university court document said. Thus, we see the first cracks in the relationship between Radica and Simona. During one of their phone calls, Radica expressed concern when Simona said she would stay a bit longer in Macedonia because she believed that school was starting soon. Simona lied and said it would be another couple of weeks before students returned from summer break. Radica was the conductor in this family. She had access to the funds that Simona relied on. With a swipe of a pen, she could change the air of the estate to someone else. And when a friend of Radica's told her that school was starting next week, and not in a couple of weeks as Simona told her, Radica was reportedly fuming. Simona, who hadn't planned on leaving her native Macedonia, now had a flight booked for her by Radica to return on August 2, to which Simona obliged. According to a report in the newspaper The Courier Mail, the two had heated verbal fights after Simona returned. According to the witness who told Radica about when school was starting, Radica told her in the month she was killed that she put her foot down with her daughter and laid out the ground rules if Simona wanted her financial support. Simona, on her mom's order, continued her schooling, but continued doing poorly. More than a month later, on September 30, Simona visited a travel agent. The purpose of the visit was to inquire about the cost of travel to Macedonia, making sure to note that it was because she had family whom she wished to visit. Simona told the agent that she was flexible with the dates on which she could travel, but she wanted to leave next month. She said she would be gone between six months and a year, and so she asked about a one-way business class flight but then she declined to confirm the booking. Then on October 7, she went back to another of the offices of the same travel agent and asked for a booking on the 28th or 29th of October. She told the agent that she'd like extra baggage allowance because she would be moving to Macedonia. On October 21, Simona made a visit to the Suncorp Bank, which held the mortgage for her home. She asked how much money she could draw against the house, to which the manager told her 175000 She told the manager that she planned a long trip to Macedonia to take care of a sick relative, and that she would be renting the home at $750 per week. However, she was told that she couldn't take out the funds immediately, and it would take up to four weeks. She declined to follow through on it. Simona had a headache, felt dizzy, and heavy when she was transported by police to the neighbor's house for questioning. What aroused immediate suspicion was that Simona didn't immediately ask about how her mother was doing. She instead asked and was allowed to speak to her boyfriend in Macedonia. She recounted the events the night before and the morning of, including the routine of putting the dog away and the sensor in her room that would detect any passers-by if her room door were open. The night of the attack, she said her door was slightly open so she could see the sensor flashing. Elaborating on her triple zero call, she said she heard, quote, large feet stomping and screeching on the wood floor, unquote, which she recognized were definitely not her mother's footsteps. She did not leave her bed to investigate because she said she was fearful. Records from her phone showed several calls to her from a number which was designated as, quote, my baby, Unquote. B 
being her boyfriend. In the early hours of that morning, the last of which finished at around 3.43 a.m. She told police that she was planning to visit her boyfriend for a quote, couple of months, unquote, and then return to Australia, but admitted she hadn't told her mom about the plan. She also told police that she withdrew $1,000 from the bank in the week before her mom's death, but that was ordered by her mom because they didn't have money. She could not explain why her mother did not go with her. She also said she had no recollection of telling the bank that she wanted to rent out the house. She was also asked by police about the incident told by the witness, where her and her mother got into an argument about when she would return from Macedonia at a time when she was reluctant to return. She denied the claim that her mom gave her an ultimatum that she would cut her off financially if she didn't return and further denied any ill will between the two. At 4 p.m. on the day of the murder, investigators discovered the piece of decking wood, which is about seven centimeters in width and 92 centimeters in length, with one of its ends being pointed so that it could be gripped with one or two hands. Prosecutors charged it was deliberately crafted that way to be used as a weapon. The wood's surface corresponded to at least one of the injuries suffered by Radica, and investigators discovered that the ceiling above Radica's bed had a brown mark corresponding to the piece of wood nicking it. Essentially, the attacker had beat Radica's face like how a lumberjack would chop wood, an overhead swing with at least one wind up catching the ceiling. There wasn't a lot of blood on the weapon, investigators said, concluding that it could have been wiped with Radica's blanket after the attack. What became central to the case was how the weapon was concealed. To get to it, the police needed to do some significant maneuvering of large objects. Specifically, the piece of wood was underneath a bookshelf. The bookshelf itself was obstructed by a moving tray and a suitcase. When investigators first walked into the room to take photos, the piece of wood would not have been seen, but when they moved the heavy objects, they discovered it jutting out. When asked about the piece of wood investigators would later discover with her mom's blood on it, she denied any knowledge of it, despite it being in her room. And I said goodnight to my mom, and she said goodnight to me, and then I went to my room. What is your knowledge of what's happened today? That Someone has broken in, my mum has been hurt, and she's passed away. Do you know how she's been hurt? Did you kill your mother like this morning or last night with that implement? No. She's questioned for nearly five hours. We had a strong relationship. She was there to yeah. support me and I was there to support her. The police would let her go. Six days later, however, in November 2016, Simona was brought in again and formally charged with her mother's murder. So Simona, I must tell you now that you're now under arrest for the murder of your mother, okay? What? But I haven't killed my mom. Like, how can you... I haven't killed her. Why would I want to kill my mom? Like, give me one good reason why I would want to kill my own mother. Detectives gave her plenty. Her relationship with her mother had been rocky. She wanted to get away from her. There was no forced entry into their house. You have no idea what I'm actually going through and you're telling me that I've killed my mother? Even with so many inconsistencies in her story, Simona keeps up the charade. This is a decking board that's covered in your mother's blood that's located in your bedroom. I told you that had nothing to do with it. You've got no explanation as to how your mum's blood got on that decking board that we found in your room? No. The prosecution's case boiled down to proving three things. That the piece of wood was the murder weapon, that it was hidden in Simona's room, and that it was Simona who hid it. Proving those would effectively eliminate from the jury's mind that it was an intruder who killed her mother. The court found that the prosecution had a compelling case proving that the piece of wood, lightly smeared with Radica's fresh blood, was the weapon. On the question about concealment, considering that it could have only been seen after some considerable maneuvering of heavy objects, made it a clear case of deliberate hiding. The final question then was who hid it? 
and it all came down to whether an intruder or intruders could have reasonably snuck into Simona's room, found a hiding spot, moved a bunch of relatively heavy objects, hid the piece of wood, and moved large objects of furniture and luggage in front of the bookshelf without alerting Simona in a room that was at best poorly lit. The jury also had to wrestle with the fact that when Simona made that triple zero call while under her blanket, she said she heard footsteps outside of the room and gave no indication that there was any movement inside of the room. Further, the fact that there was no blood on Simona was mitigated by the possibility that she could have cleaned the blood off of her. Her fingers and hands being clean could be explained by her using a single pair of rubber gloves that she later disposed of. In addition, had an intruder killed Radica and fled, there would surely have been blood splatter in other parts of the house, but again, the blood was confined to Radica's room. In other words, Radica was possibly killed hours before the triple zero call, which would have given Simona enough time to clean herself and any blood splatter outside of Radica's room and then ransack the home to make it look like a home invasion. The prosecution's case was also aided by the circumstances surrounding Simona's life. Her doing poorly in school, her wanting to live with her boyfriend in Macedonia, and her visiting the bank to inquire about borrowing against the home that was in her name. Simona attempted to pin the blame on ex-husband Jack, who would have had the next best reason to kill Radica after their divorce. But it was concluded that Jack was in Macedonia at the time of the killing. In March 2019, Simona was found guilty of killing her mother in a rage-filled attack prompted by her desire to be free from her mother's grip and start a fresh life in Macedonia with her boyfriend. The final story is as follows. Sometime in October, Simona had hatched a plan to get rid of her mother. She would have had the initial inklings of a plan when she went to the travel agent and asked about trips on October 28 or 29 and likely solidified that plan when she visited the bank to ask about how much she could borrow against the house. Then, on the night of the murder, she waited. She had the piece of wood already prepared. Radica was not necessarily known to sleep all that early. In fact, according to an examination of both her phones, she had sent one text on one phone at 12 11 a.m. and a text on another phone at 1.40 a.m. Between then and before 7 a.m., Simona stealthily crept into her mother's bedroom, raised a piece of wood over her head like a lumberjack preparing to chop wood, and came down as hard as she could on her mother's head. The initial blows awoke Radica, who reacted in shock, but then subsequent blows would have disoriented her and then put her out of consciousness. Simona, who had no previous criminal history, was sentenced to life in prison with parole eligibility after 20 years. The decision was upheld by the Supreme Court of Queensland after an appeal. Queensland judge ordered that Simona forfeit her right to the family's estate when she murdered her mother. If Simona gets out, she'll have her fresh start, but with much less money. Simona's story had always seemed suspect. First, in the triple zero call, she made it a point to say that she did not have a boyfriend when asked if she suspected that made-up intruder could be an old boyfriend. Perhaps in the moment she thought that answer would remove a motive to kill her mother. The Court of Appeal also pointed out a number of other holes in this Swiss cheese story. For one, when she made the call, it would have been assumed that the intruders would have already concealed the weapon yet they were inexplicably still in the house, chatting and getting the dogs all riled up. Why would they remain after concealing the weapon? Why would they go through so much trouble concealing the weapon in Simona's room when there was a risk of waking her up? If they were going to leave the weapon in the house, they would more likely find a hiding spot with less resistance and less alerting potential. A sad side tale of this story is that Simona knew her mom bought her that gold necklace for her birthday when she told police she knew where it was stashed. Simona knew the extent her mom went to to make her life as easy as possible, encouraging her to continue schooling because her future depended on it. Was Simona so short-sighted that she thought she could just up 
leave with an inheritance, and live a new life without her mother's guidance? Or was it more so that she felt her mother was overbearing and even controlling, and that she would rather go to prison than deal with the constraints? We may never know because it appears Simona will never admit to the crime. As for the house at 14 Jalinda Place, it was sold in June 2017 for $800,000, according to PropertyValue.com. Aw man, is it really the end? Anyway, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to me narrate this story. As always, these stories are based on secondary and primary sources, including police reports and court records. Major shout out to all the reporters who strive to inform the public about these cases. And major shout out to you guys for following this channel and engaging with the subject matter. I'm focused on getting at least one relatively underreported case once a week with the hope of having a solid time for when I will upload regularly. In the meantime, please be safe, and most importantly, please don't be Simona.